All right. Let's see here. So, um, I was um, so last time we ended by I, I defined um, you know a measurable set uh, if it's the characteristic function a set is measurable if the characteristic function s of, is is a locally integral function um, so you define the measure of a set in terms of the integral of the characteristic function and um, so yes some. Um, some you know some nice theorems about how to you know taking unions of measurable sets and things like that, and um, and then his a function f is called measurable if there exists a sequence of step functions that converges to f almost everywhere. So that's what a measurable function is. Um, and um, then his theorem 2.11.6: the measurable functions form a vector space. The absolute value of, of a measurable function is its is a measurable function. The product of measurable functions is a measurable function. Um, and uh, then finally, his theorem 2.11.7, if f is a measurable function and the absolute value of f is bounded by g for some locally, locally integrable function g, then f is locally integrable. Um, so that's kind of, a, kind of an analog to like the, um, oh, maybe like the Weierstrass the theorem from um, m-test in, uh, in complex analysis or something. But. Anyway, so that, that was the uh, theorem on the, the, the section on measurable sets. And oh, I should begin with a word of prayer before I, before I forget. So, Dearly Father, we uh, thank you for the stage. Just pray that you'd help me to uh, gather our thoughts and just uh, finish this chapter well today, Lord. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. So, um, we go on here to the complex integrable functions. I'll just say a few words about that. So, um, so we're going to be kind of in uh, survey mode today a little bit. And um, I'll try to uh, make the survey focus on the parts which are most interesting. Uh, complex valued integrable functions. Complex valued integrable functions. So here he, um, he looks at, you know, functions, basically the functions we're talking about are like this, all right? They're functions from the reals to the complexes, all right? And um, he, he begins by defining, you know, a complex step function is something like this. F of x is lambda one, um, chi one, excuse me, chi of a one to b one, and then plus lambda two chi of a2 to b2. So it's again, it's the same thing we had before, right? What's the difference? Yeah, the, 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 yeah exactly. The lambdas are complex is the difference. And so this is a complex valued step function. And the integral of the step function is defined just as we did before. It's just now it's, it's a complex linear combination. And um, he basically says that the complex integral works like this. It is equal to the integral of the real part plus i times the integral of the imaginary part of f, right, like that. And, um, and then he talks about complex valued functions, LeBay integrable, if there exists a sequence of step functions that has the following two conditions, and they're exactly the two conditions we saw before. So it's just, just boilerplate everything we did before. The difference being, of course, that, um, you know, theorem 2.12, a complex function is integrable if and only if its real and imaginary parts are integrable. Moreover, if, if f is integrable, then, then this. <laughs> so like this, this pretty much is it. So if you know that the real part and the imaginary part are the Bay integrable, then their complex linear combination is likewise, you know, Integrable. Here f is equal to the real part of f plus i times the imaginary part of f. And you can write down formulas for those. Do you guys know the formulas? Like the real part of f, you can get from f um, plus f star, I think, divided by 2. So, um, and then the imaginary part, if I remember right, is. 
um, f minus f conjugate divided by 2i, yeah. So in particular, if f is real, then the imaginary part is zero, right? And if f is pure imaginary, the real part is zero. But generically speaking, you know that. And the proof is basically resting, like his proofs of everything <laughs> basically are going to fall. They're all going to fall on this, guys. Like it's, it's essentially this. It just boils down to this. Like pretty much all the uh, proofs in this section boil down to the fact that the absolute value, the, the complex absolute value of a plus b is, you know, greater than a, and it's also greater than b, right? So. Basically, if you have an estimate for the complex linear combination, you have an estimate for the real part, you have an estimate for the, the, the imaginary part, and then you can also play games to work backwards from that. Anyway, so then he, he says a complex valued function on R is, is locally integrable if its real part and imaginary part are locally integrable. So it's just, it's just, it's just cut and paste, like of everything we've done before, basically. You just you have to have it for the real and the imaginary part. So I, that's why I said this section is not that uh, not that interesting actually. The absolute value, uh, yeah. see, the absolute value of a locally integrable complex valued function is locally integrable. So oh, that's kind of neat. So in other words, if you have if you have that the integral of f um, exists where f is a function you know, from R to C, like that, then the integral of absolute value of F exists, where this means the integral of the real part of F squared plus the imaginary part of F squared, square rooted, you know? That's kind of interesting. I mean, so. That theorem is more interesting here than it was to me. Well, I mean, I don't know. I think. Well, maybe it's almost part of the definition in the other one, but, well, no, no, no. Let me shut up. Okay, so next up, he talks about the spaces LP of R, all right? And um, so section 2.13, this is LPR, which is an important example, I suppose. And let's just, I'm, I'm mostly interested in the definition for this section. It's so, here it is. For P greater than one, LPR is the space of all, ah, complex valued, complex valued locally integrable functions such that the pth power of the uh, modulus is an element of L1R. Huh. So this is LP. So here, again, uh, we're talking about complex values, so the absolute value of f is, again, the square root of the real square root plus the imaginary square root, or, I mean, this, here, absolute value of f, you could write as the square root of f, f star, you know? You could also write that, and that's also, it would be, you know, accurate. Anyway, um, in this context, he says you can define a norm, you can define a norm like this, norm sub p equal to the pth root of the integral of the pth power like this. And um, so you see what's going on here is it's, you know, these are like the continuous extension of the, uh, 
the little LP spaces we talked about at the beginning, right? Like we started with sequences that were, you know, summable in these, with respect to these pth power um, convergence rules. And now that summation over, you know, a sequence, you know, the, 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 the summation over a series, I guess, um, I mean, it, it was a summing up a sequence, so it was a series technically. But um, so we replaced series with integrals now in this, this here. So it's, it, it, it is, but <clears throat> I think the mathematics that establishes that that's a norm is very much related to the same arguments that were made in chapter one in terms of the Holder inequality and Minkowski's inequality. So like his, his proofs in here, his like theorem, theorem 2.13.2 is, is Holder's inequality. And he, he, he supposes that, uh, you know, you've got a P and a Q between one and infinity and the reciprocals add to one. So if you have one less than P comma Q less than infinity with one over P plus one over Q equals to one, then um, you get that the one norm of the product f and g is less than or equal to the p norm of f times the q norm of g, where, of course, these are being defined as above. So this is Holder's inequality, and um, the proof is um, given on page 74 to 75, I, I have a strong suspicion that it's very much analogous to what was done earlier in chapter one, but I haven't double checked on that though, so truth in advertising here. Um, and then Minkowski's inequality is, you know, Minkowski's inequality is the triangle inequality here for this norm. And, and there, p has one less than or equal to p less than or equal to infinity. Um, and um, so in view of those, and the fact that you can argue it's a vector space, all right? So you have a vector space, you've got a norm, so it's a norm linear space, LP, LPR is a norm linear space. But then his next theorem, 2.13.4, is that in fact this space is complete, all right? So in fact, this is a Banach space. LPR is a Banach space. The space of all complex valued locally integrable functions forms a Banach space. Meaning that every Cauchy sequence converges inside the, every Cauchy sequence of Lebesgue integrable functions, every Cauchy sequence of complex valued Lebesgue integrable functions. So, and um, so that's, that's, Seems like you're saying something there, doesn't it? Um, proof's about a page. And then, um, here, here. Ah. Okay, so um, he also introduces for omega a measurable set. subset of R. He says you can define LP, L upper P of omega. What's that going to be? This is the space of all complex valued measurable functions F on omega. For which what? The integral over omega of the epsilon value of f to the p power is less than infinity. And how do you how do you define the norm in this thing? Is it just holder? 
Yeah, it's, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's essentially the same thing we just wrote over there, but what's the difference? We're integrating over omega, so it's the, you know, it's the usual, you know, restricted integral, if you will, that we talked about in the locally integrable section. Well, it's that concept suitably extended to measurable sets, which I haven't quite explained everything about. My bad. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I've been cheating you on some details in the later half of the chapter, for sure. Um, but you know, to whom much is given, much is required. So I have given you less, I will require less. Let's see here. But um, <laughs> so anyway, um, he says that LP omega can be identified with a subspace of LPR of all functions vanishing outside of omega. So you can view this space, yeah? You can think of it as kind of a subset of um, LP of R with the understanding that you just take these functions and extend them zero outside of omega, and then they would automatically be LP. They would be in there. See, because this integral would be equal to that integral if the function in question was zero outside omega. So it's, it's a kind of a trivial. It's, it's, I'm not really saying much. Um, and then he also finally introduces this, and so this is, this is kind of a funky thing. I don't know what this thing is called, but L infinity R is also of interest. So that's, I would, I would think that's the soup norm, right? And um, he says you have to introduce the essential supremum. <laughs> the essential supremum. I, I don't think I've seen this before. I don't know, like, I, I guess I've lived a sheltered life. ESS sup. S up. S up F, which is apparently it's the smallest number M. Smallest number M such that F is less than or equal to M almost everywhere. He says if no such number exists, we write S sup is infinity. And then he says, L infinity R is defined as the space of all measurable functions such that the essential supremum is finite. Um, the essential supremum of the absolute value of F is finite. And the norm, well, what's the norm in this? He uses sub infinity. The norm in this is given by the essential supremum of F. Oh, weird. Huh. Man. So I guess that's why that is like what you're the uniform continuity of parts system. Yeah. I just I think it's almost everywhere case. It's it's <laughs> less than or equal to M almost everywhere. So like so you could have a function that was, you know, like it had a whole bunch of values or it was a half, and then if there's like, you know, a handful, like 10 values, where it's equal to 2 or 7 or 9, the, then the essential supremum would be a half. Yeah. Because there's, you know, it's, it's ignoring maximums for the functions that are kind of like isolated. They, um, it's almost everywhere, less than or equal to m. That's, that's interesting, I mean, but anyway. And of course, um, that is also a complete space. All right. All right. So that brings us to um, section 14, where I think there's a little bit more for you guys to learn. I mean, well, there's things for you guys to learn here, right? But um, this is really just kind of everything we've done so far today is more or less in the same vein of what we've talked about before. What I'm about to talk about is genuinely different. All right. So here is. How do you, so the, the question that we're now um, broaching is, how does this go in n dimensions? All right, and you might say, well, didn't you just do two dimensions? Not really, not really, because it was, well, I mean, yes, how can I say this? I don't see it in this book, but I fully believe that if you can do this for complex 
right? I think very likely, I haven't checked on all this, but let me just make a claim. I'm pretty sure I would be shocked if I was wrong about this. Um, you could equally well write sections about vector valued, um, vector valued function of a real variable. Like I could replace the complex valued with like vector valued. And so long as that vector space had a nice, well-behaved norm in the sense of finite dimensional vector spaces, as long as it's got these, you know, those kinds of, you know, that the, um, the norm is such that the, the component, you know, the component functions um, are bounded by the norm of a, the norm of the, of the vector valued function is larger than the norm of the absolute value of any component function forming. Um, so any, any vector valued function can be written as a, as, a, as a linear combination of component functions. Just like real plus imaginary, those are the component functions of the complex valued. So if you can do it for real and imaginary, you probably could just as well do it for like, you know, Rn valued. You could probably do Rn valued with about the same techniques. I, I, don't, I don't think you'd get into trouble here because all of the like sophisticated stuff is going on in the domain, which is the reals. So in that sense, I don't think the complex section is, I mean, yes, it's complex. And these are also complex, right? Complex valued. But the, the, the complexity, if you will, <laughs> I don't really, I don't want that word. The, um, the two dimensionality, if you will, it's, it's all in the range. It's not the hard part. The hard part is in the domain. When you make the domain multidimensional, that's, <laughs> that's a different animal. And that's what section 14 is about. How do you extend the integration theory to n dimensions? So he jumps straight from 1 to n, which is, you know, I like it. Yeah? This is base case. <laughs> this is his base case. Yes, this, this whole chapter is an induction. <laughs> it's very good. Um, so integration in Rn. So he um, talks about a semi-open interval. In um, Rn, huh? Is that is that my laptop? Oh, see, the uh, the zoom makes it think like this laptop never makes any noise. Like I'm I'm stressing it out with the zoom. It's good. Give it a workout. Let's see here. So uh, I'm, I'm, my, I'm on my Liberty laptop, Audric. It's, I figured out how to turn the mic on. I, my, uh, my other laptop, the thing is, if there's any kind of password required, it put that stupid backslash in it, and then, <laughs> you know, it, 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 you can't rely on that to put any password in because the keyboard's corrupted. So it's trash. I have to get a new laptop, but I haven't. I, I like to, I, I don't buy a new laptop on, on 30 minutes research, right? I need to spend some time. And I don't really trust Daniel. Um, I mean, I trust him to find something, but I'll have to verify that, you know, it's, it's good. But this is a semi-open interval in Rn. So you take the Cartesian product of n, you know, half open, uh, I guess we're calling it clopen, uh, you know, Cartesian product of n clopen intervals, if you like. That's a Cartesian product there. And um, he points out, like, more to the point, so if this is i, x as a vector, as an element of i, if and only if what? If and only if um, a sub k is less than or equal to x sub k is less than b sub k for all k equals to 1, 2, da, 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 n. All right, great. And, see, now his measure theory is showing. Thank you. Ha! And now he's like, define the measure of I. <laughs> the measure of I, what is it going to be equal to? So the measure of I going to be the product, right? 
the product i equals 1 to n of uh, b sub i minus a sub i. b1 minus a1, b2 minus a2, da 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 da, uh, bn minus an. So there you go, there. that's the measure. And then he, he uh, dropped some knowledge on us here. In n, in n equals 1, the measure is the length, right? In n equals 2, we're talking about a, a rectangle, it's the area. And n equals to 3, you're talking about a, a rectangular cube. So it's not a cube, right? But, you know, but then it's the volume, right? So measure, measure is a generalization of length, area, volume, that kind of thing. And, um, and then he, what, what do you think the step function is going to be? What's the step function? You can write f as what? f is equal to lambda 1 um, chi i1 plus dot, 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 plus lambda n chi i n. And um, I, well, okay, to be fair, I'm not doing this right yet, guys. Um, let me fix this. I need to fix something. The and oh, I'll do it in red. He is distinguishing, he's distinguishing between little n and big n. That's important. Little n is an arbitrary thing you could use for a sequence or something. Big n is the fixed dimension of the domain that we're talking about here. So I really should have a big n here. I should have a big n here. I should have a big n here. I should have a big n. I already have it here. Um, I already had it there. I missed it over here, though. All right. Now this one is not big N. This is little n because the step function, how many steps you have, it's got nothing to do with the dimension of the space. You could have just one, you could have two, whatever. That's a step function. All right, so we got that. And how are you going to define the integral? What is it, Audric? Okay. And what, what's the integral of a step function? And, and by the way, I think you could take lambda to be complex here if you wanted. But he doesn't say that, so we'll, we'll keep it real. But I have a strong suspicion everything I'm saying here you could do for complex valued. Yeah. And, and truth be told, I think you probably could do it for vector valued <laughs> with a little more work. Um, so anyway, there's... I guess that's always a question. How general do you want to be, right? So um, real mathematicians spend all their time quibbling over that and never get anything done. So <laughs> um, so the integral of f, where f is a step function, what's it going to be? OK, but what, is, what should that be equal to? What should the integral of? the characteristic function of I1B. Well, See, what we, put, what we put here in the one-dimensional case was B minus A. We put B1 minus A1 there. We can't do that now. I mean, we could put, I guess we could put all this, but we don't want to do that. So we simply put this. It's the measure of I1. So that's the volume, the hypervolume, if you wish, um, corresponding to the semi-open interval I1. And you keep doing this. So so the measure informs the integral in this fashion. And then you can define um, you know, LeBay integral function on Rn. What's the definition? Definition um, f function from Rn to R or C, he mentions it. He fesses up. You could go R or C here. It's called LeBay integral. Ah, I always misspell it. LeBay. 
Oh, come on. Lebesgue integrable. If there exists sequence of step functions, all right, such that what? A, the sum, n equals 1 to infinity of the integral of the absolute value of fn is less than infinity, and b, um, f of x is equal to the summation n equals 1 to infinity of f sub n of x um, for each x in Rn such that the um, sum n equals 1 to infinity of the absolute value of fn of x is less than infinity. So it is verbatim, verbatim the conditions that we wrote for the one-dimensional case, right? It's just now the, uh, the integral that we're writing is defined over, you know, semi step functions built over semi step semi open um, intervals in 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 n dimensions, and um, so and of course we still need to actually define the integral. What is it going to be? Some of the step functions, right? Some of the integrals of the step functions, yeah. So, indeed. The integral of f is then defined by the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the integral of fn. Then the integral of f is by definition the sum n equals 1 to infinity of the integral of fn. Which is how we defined it in the one dimensional case as well. <laughs> okay, so. And the space of all the Bay integrable functions on Rn is denoted L1Rn. So here. Oops, my bad. N. Big N. Okay. And um, he says, then you can also define locally integrable on Rn. So what would that mean? What would locally, inter locally integrable on Rn look like? locally integrable on Rn is, is meaning that for every bounded interval i, so it's all f for which every bounded um, Interval, interval, see interval, bounded interval i, okay, I mean he's saying interval, I guess he called that an interval too, okay fine, the question is what do you mean by interval, every bounded interval um, of Rn, um, gives, you know, f times the characteristic function of that interval is Lebe integrable on Rn. So that, that's exactly what we did in one dimension, except in one dimension the bounded intervals could without loss of generality be sort of pictured as like closed interval A to B, you know, so. But here, I would think of I as it, it could be, um, I mean, I think, I think it's just basically the Cartesian product of, um, you know, closed intervals. You could look at it like that. It's, anyway, it's a set which you can 
put in a uh, in a in a in a sphere of a sufficiently large radius. You know, it's a finite. It's 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 not an infinite set. It's in the sense of you know distance in n dimensions. It's yeah. Um, and then he says a Lebesgue measure on R n can be defined. Um, let's see here. How does he say that? Let me write it down. So here we go. <laughs> Come on, get, get out there. <laughs> Talk about measurable here for a second. Um, S subset of R n is measurable. Um, if the characteristic function of S is locally integrable on our end. And the measure of S mu S would then be the integral of the characteristic function of S in this context. And then he says, if, if the characteristic function is locally integrable but not integrable, then we define mu S to be infinity. Um, so, So, for, for example, you could have like a slab. Um, uh, let's see here. Well, I mean, f could be constant. Like, f could be the constant function 1 over all of our n. That would be locally integrable. Like, locally integrable doesn't mean much. Um, so, Let's see here. Uh, let me just talk about R3 for a second, right? If you want to picture something, you can think about like, I mean, I was thinking about the slab. Right? So here, my, my S. I could write as, you know, basically it's R2. Um, a Cartesian product with, um, I don't know, maybe that's going from 2 to 3 or something, right? So that, that's a subset of R3. Um, I believe it's measurable because... Um, its characteristic function, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's locally integrable on R3. And on the other hand, I also think that it's going to have, I think the measure of this would be infinity. Because um, what did he say? Um, if it's not, it's, it's locally, if the characteristic function is locally integrable but not integrable, we can define mu s to be infinity. So I, I don't, on the other hand, I'm, I'm, re I'm relatively certain that the integral of the characteristic function of s, right, um, does not exist, right? I mean, in the Lebesgue sense at least, because Essentially, it would be capturing the volume of the slab, right? But the volume of the slab is infinity, so its measure should be infinity. Measure is an abstraction of the concept of volume, so. All right. Now, um, a function f is called measurable if there exists a sequence of step functions such that fn goes to f almost everywhere. So f measurable. 
What's that? Oh, I'm, I'm coming. You talking to me, Audrey? I'm going to move you. Okay. I've got. Uh... <laughs> you can see me now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. This, I, this, the battery in my laptop works, so I'm, I'm like all giddy. I'm cordless, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, sorry, I'm easily amused. So yeah, f is a measurable function if um, there exists a, uh, a sequence of step functions that converge to f almost everywhere. And then he says, for a measurable set, you know, measurable set, so, you know, omega measurable, You can define the integral over omega of f to be equal to the integral of f times the characteristic function of omega. So, yeah. And then he defines LPRN, right? and L infinity Rn, much as we just defined them for R. All right, so like LP, it's, it's going to be, means the pth power of the modulus of F is itself a LeBay integral function on Rn. And the um, the essential supremum defines the norm on that guy, and it's it's again just the smallest number m such that f is less than or equal to m almost everywhere. And um, so this is all f such that the essential supremum of f is 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 less than infinity. I need an absolute value here. And the norm, again, is defined just like we defined it. It's just now this stuff is happening in n dimensions. And I'm hoping next he's going to tell us it's complete. Nope. Maybe that was in the paragraph I just skipped over. Well, he doesn't tell me, but by golly, I believe this is also a Banach space. I would be shocked <laughs> if it was not, all right? I mean, it almost has to be, because when n equals to 1, it is. So it would be a very weird situation to have it, oh yeah, it's a Banach space when n equals 1, but when you get to 2 or 3, you know, yeah. Oh yeah, but that's for R. So I'm, I'm talking about page 79. But it's okay. I, I just don't think he. I mean, he's he's he basically this. I love this page 78 and 79. They're really really cool because what's happening is it's compressing essentially the whole chapter, right? The whole chapter is compressed into these two pages where we see how the theory plays out for our end. So it's, it's this beautiful replay of the whole chapter just for the generalization to our end, which is, you know, it's pretty cool. Oh, he did? 2.35. Ah, is a Banach space. Ah, thank you. Very good, Audric. I, uh, I should learn to read. But um, <laughs> I... I felt bad in physics today. This kid said, so he, I asked a calculation and he told me 7,500. And then I made, I made fun of what he told me because it was like physically ridiculous. But then I felt bad because like kind of mocking the kid for doing the calculator wrong in class. And I wasn't trying to single him out. It was just, it was just funny. He had like a, a car going 20 meters per second and a bus going 10 meters per second. And then 
I was like, what's the speed of them after they collide? And he's like, 7,500 meters per second. And I'm like, how about 7.5? No, it wasn't the speed. It was like the components of the velocity, but, but anyway. OK, so what's, what? I, I just, I felt, I, <sighs> comedy, comedy is, comedy is dangerous, you know? Comedy is dangerous. OK, so that brings us to his, his applications, if you will, of the higher dimensional integral. And his, his principal applications are two. The first application he gives is the theorem of Fubini, which um, in a nutshell says that you can do the double integral either y then x or x then y. Um, now, I, I don't know. It would be interesting to know the full hist to like the full story of Fubini because, man, whatever theorem Fubini actually proved, it's not the ones we see in books because it's, you know, I, I, I don't know. Like it's, it, I think it's something more general. Um, but this is an example of Fubini's theorem, for sure, and um, he proves it. The proof is essentially using the fact that you can write the functions in terms of you know, s series of step functions, and as such, you can. Um, well, I think if you, I think if you look at this hard enough, you're going to see that it basically boils down to the fact that Fubini's theorem is true for step functions, <laughs> and then because it's true for step functions, it then becomes, it becomes true for, for everything. I, I, I may be putting words in his mouth here, but it's about two pages, and I am tired. Um, but there is a proof of Fubini's theorem here for Lebesgue integral functions on, in, in, in the plane, all right? And then what's more important to me, though, is section 2.15, where he introduces the convolution, all right? So, because I'd like to talk to you guys more about the convolution. Um, not, not just today, either. This is an important idea. And I don't, well, it's kind of not really being motivated here at all. But here it is. If f and g are Lebesgue integrable, all right, then f of x minus y times g of y is integrable. He says, for almost all x and r, which leaves me wondering, what about the y you just wrote there? But anyway, I'll, I'll suspend my disbelief here for a second. Moreover, the convolution, the convolution here it is, f star g, f star g of x is equal to the integral of f of x minus y times g of y dy. And he says that this convolution is an integrable function. And not just that, this is an integrable function And not just that, the uh, the uh, integral of the absolute, the integral of the absolute value of the convolution is less than or equal to the product of the integrals of the absolute value of f and the absolute value of g. And then. He gives a proof of this, and the proof of this rests on Fubini's theorem. All right, it, it rests on Fubini's theorem and doing an integration in the plane. Actually, it's a two-dimensional proof, and um, so that might be new actually to me. But then, the, one of the essential properties of convolution theorem, which is that the convolution of f and, and g 
is equal to the convolution of G and F. So like convolution is commutative. It's kind of a neat, neat property. And then, and then um, he mentions that that is true because of the change of variables theorem that I did not prove for you guys. <laughs> okay, so that rests on the change of variables theorem that I, I skipped. And then he finally tells us that uh, if f is an integrable function and g is bounded locally integrable, let me write this down, theorem. So if f is integrable and g is bounded locally integrable, bounded and locally integrable function, all right, then the convolution is a continuous function. I thought he was going to tell me it's integrable, but I guess we already knew that. And uh, yeah, he does give an explicit um, calculation which proves that the, um, the difference between the convolution at x plus t and the convolution at x is bounded by um, the integral of the absolute value of a difference of f. But since he's assuming that f is continuous, the difference of f and uh, the difference of f at two, two values closely, wait a minute, f is not continuous. Since f is integrable, it follows that he can bound that, that integral. So, and in so doing, he gets continuity of the, uh, <clears throat> the convolution here. So, um, have you guys ever heard of convolution before? From, from where? I've heard the term, I haven't gotten like, um, ah. something else, but I have to say get it away. Good. Well, then I can show you something concrete about it. We have just enough time to get us into trouble. So let me do that. So that's it for chapter two, by the way, guys. Like, that's pretty much it. I, what I'm going to do, just to let you know where we're going, um, next week we'll be in. Hilbert spaces, woohoo, finally, our namesake, right? And um, so I will give you guys a week to wrap up whatever homework you're going to do on this chapter, and then we'll plan for the test one on the, um, the week after that. So I will give you guys a, you know, this is what's going, here's likely questions for test one. Um, my advisor did this for me in like higher level courses. We always had like a, a list of these are good questions for the test. And um, I found that that was, I learned a lot from his classes because I always, I was ready for those proof questions, you know. And um, I'm not always organized enough to do that, but it would be better if I was. Let's see here. So anyway, for you guys, I'm going to make a point of doing that. All right. Uh, and in terms of the problems you should do in chapter two, um, like I don't have a strong opinion about it still. I mean, I'm trying to develop an opinion, but really just, you know, maybe pick 10 problems in chapter two to do. I think if you did 10, that would be more than enough. You know, maybe not even that many. Um, all right. Will you, will you set us the take you want to do, or do you say we should? Um, so, let's see here. Why don't you guys do... Um, all right, I'll, 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 I will, I will be the decider. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Uh, let, let's see here. Let's say, um, number two. I'm going to add some terms and conditions here. Problem number two on page 85, but you don't have to show everything. Just show something about why that's true, right? Because it says to show it's a vector space, which means that if you want to get all axiomatic on it, you could say a lot. I'm really just interested in you checking like an axiom of the vector space, okay? Um, 
let's say problem four, part A. I think if you can do part A, you should, you know, have a good understanding of what's going on there. Um, let's see here. Um, Probably pro problem nine probably would be smart one to work on because that'll I think that would help things set in. Um, have you done any already, already, Jake? Uh, no, not yet. I haven't had a chance, but I'll just look at the other one. It's all good. Um, number fourteen would be good to do. I think 18 might be fun. Oof. I guess I'll let, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna put 20 on you guys because you should have something hard, so. And it's, that's hard, I, that to me looks hard, but it's also famous and worth fiddling with for your sort of future, you know, situational awareness. <laughs> this is an example and a construction that is not obvious. Um, so number 20 might be a good thing. Let's see here. How many am I up to? Uh, about six. Six, all right. Um, Phil. I suppose 31 would be good. Three more. Three more. Um, Thirty-two. Let's see here. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Well, I don't know. You guys pick. Just pick something else, okay? That's, I mean, I, I, I'm tempted to say, you know, maybe the convolution, maybe like number 44, but, um, you know, just like, well, I don't know, though. That, that does, I'm hesitant to say 44. Um, I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't have a good sense of it, guys. So, I'm sure I've missed something in telling you these lists. So, but hey, the, my, my list of things that you should study should fix that, right? So I think that's enough what I've told you already. Um, okay, so, checking my time.